Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Sacred Games Daily. We did something a little different last week with our hour-long episode and really good conversation. And, you know, there's been a lot of Bethesda talk in the air since the Fallout show came out, talking about Fallout, talking about Elder Scrolls, talking about how long it takes them to make games, how Starfield was. And it's just really got, I mean, me more so, but I think also, Joe, it just got us, like, interested in the topic of, Mm -hmm. Whether it be the Fallout show or Fallout games or just Bethesda in general. And I thought, well, I, I thought it would be good to have this conversation because Bethesda is so topical right now. But what actually kicked off uh, and spawned this idea for this episode was is I had a dream last night about Todd Howard. A dry one? <laughs> it was a completely dry dream, yes. But I had a legitimate it was a very it was a very nice dream that I really liked. OK, so when I woke up, it was kind of sad that it wasn't real, but it was it was very uh, yeah. um, wholesome. Uh, it was me and my younger brother, who is the is a much bigger Bethesda fan than me. Um, it was me and him got invited to go to Todd Howard's house okay. and we went to Todd. We went to Todd Howard's house and he had a, a nice home, but it wasn't like a rich, rich home. It was like a home like maybe I would live in. It was just a normal kind of two story house. OK. Um, and, uh, he was there with his wife and his kids who I have no idea what his wife and kids look like, but in my dream, I, they had faces and I, I made them up and, and, uh, I met his <laughs> wife and she was very nice. And his kids, his kids were all like 12 or younger, which is right. probably not true. I'm assuming he has kids. If he does, they're probably older than that. Um, and, uh, they were making us a home cooked meal. It was like a oh, pasta yeah. or something like that. And. We were just talking to Todd Howard and telling him how we liked the Fallout show. And I remember telling him that, like, I thought it was like up there with The Last of Us. And he was really impressed by that comment. Uh -huh. Like, I'm like, I'm the first one he's ever heard this from. And uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, then this this is kind of the most random part is then uh, we went with Todd Howard and his family out into the street. And we walked around the block with a thousand other Bethesda fans. All right. Just like cheering for Bethesda. They just like waiting outside Fallout his show. house or something. Yeah, it's like a, we had the VIP access, but like the fans were out there and we just marched around the block with like, you know, you know, be people dressed up like uh, Pip Boy or with their Pip Boy and then like mm -hmm. the Boltec guy and all that stuff and just celebrate. And then we came back to his house and uh, he had a pullout bed from his couch. Right. And that's where me and my brother slept was on his pullout couch. And then I woke up and I realized that I don't have this kind of relationship with Todd Howard, which is really <laughs> sad. Um, so my question to that is, what drugs are you on and can I have some? I don't know. I think I think it's well the drugs. I think the drugs are are, are Bethesda experiences, right? Because okay. uh okay. I've been playing I've been playing uh well I've been dip I dipped literally dipped where you like I literally put a toe in like five minutes or less in like every Bethesda game this week. I'm just like I'm gonna oh, boot really? up Skyrim and oh, okay. yeah, I'm gonna boot up Skyrim and run around for two seconds. Ah, cool. I'm gonna boot up Fallout New Vegas. But you know, but I've mostly spent a few hours lately in Fallout Four, um, trying to give that a second shot because I haven't played Fallout Four properly in nine mm -hmm. years i played it at launch i checked my my account still there from nine years ago it's i was level 38 i had like 50 some hours of gameplay i beat the game my character's name was booker like from bioshock infinite why uh, why booker what? i thought it fit it fit the 1950s feel okay so the build wasn't like the build wasn't inspired by booker. no it was just like oh this sounds like a 50s name potentially okay. which makes cool. sense when you think about bioshock infinite and kind of the style of, the, of columbia and stuff um i'm but, always boring uh, yeah. with characters i just put joe <laughs> it's tough sometimes i do that um but yeah it's tough i get really obsessed with the name sometimes but yeah, yeah, yeah. so i've been playing a little bit of fallout 4 trying to reevaluate it trying to get into it i'm having a hard time i'm only like three mm. four hours in and i'm just not having the most fun but today's episode is basically just joe and i going on and on back and forth about bethesda as a whole um our experiences with bethesda uh bethesda's pros their cons what the future of Bethesda looks like, what we'd like to see from them. A little bit of the Fallout show. There won't be any, I mean, there'll be spoilers for, let's say, I would say any game prior to Starfield. And then if we wanted to talk yeah. about Starfield in some really specific way, I, I wouldn't think we would. We would definitely warn you and say, like, skip a minute ahead or something. If it was some yeah. big, I don't think we would, though. But, like, and we won't spoil the Fallout show. I mean, just maybe talk about some experience with it. Did you, have you watched all of it yet? I've watched, uh... I've watched six episodes, so I'm on the seventh. Are you liking it? Yeah, it's really good. It's really it's, good, right? It's good. I have my issues with it, but okay. but it's it's good. Give me give me one of the issues because I we don't really hear many people talk about issues with it. It's just how um, awesome it is. 
so you wouldn't know this uh, without kind of playing the video games, but uh, Bethesda's video games. And this this will go on to like my kind of negatives about Bethesda's view okay. of Fallout in general. But um, to sum it up, it, it very much kind of feels just like um, the, the Bethesda games, that the post-apocalypse is just a bunch of symbolic things to sell kind of fan service on and to sell the franchise on. And it never feels like anything evolves in the wasteland. Um, you talking about in games or in game games and show and the show because it okay. very much takes notes from the way Bethesda interpret for it does feel like they're like hey here's the dog hey here's the red rocket hey here's the yep. stim pack mm-hmm. yeah yeah okay that's fair that's a good point okay um well first off Joe what was your first ever Bethesda experience like the first game you played uh it was Oblivion it was Oblivion yeah, it was on the Oblivion. 360? Yeah. Um, I didn't play it all the way through. I didn't spend a lot of time with it because by the time I hit Oblivion, it was kind of getting to that point where it was somewhat of an outdated RPG experience. Yeah. Um, uh, I didn't really click with like the art style of Oblivion in many ways. It's very like overly saturated in many ways. Um, saturated, colorful, very yeah. typical fantasy. Yeah. It's like Western so, fantasy. It's like high fantasy with a capital H. Yeah. And yeah. by the time I, I kind of experienced Oblivion, like Fallout 3 was kind of out um and uh obviously skyrim was like on the precipice of, of essentially releasing for me um so it was around like, like 2010 2011 time when i when i experienced all of that uh but yeah that was my first that was my first so you never experience. beat oblivion proper no never beat it did you beat what was the first bethesda game you beat was it three. skyrim three Th- fallout three yeah 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 Fallout three okay and you really liked fallout three i liked it i i did thoroughly enjoy it but um Ever since I went back and played Fallout 1 and 2, like those, again, those Bethesda games retroactively, Bethesda made Fallout games, that is, not New Vegas, uh, have kind yeah. of like, I don't know, they've been diluted, my experience. You're more you're more into the original like Black Rock type. Yeah, the Black Isle interplay, uh, Obsidian style of the way they interpret that retrofuturism and stuff, which is, yeah, so. Okay, so... Here's kind of where I mean, and, and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell the real shortened version because if you listen to the Sacred Icon podcast at all, I've told the story at least five times over the course of of doing that podcast. But basically, for me, uh, my first Bethesda. Well, I did get a copy of Morrowind for the Xbox original. Yep. It was in a bin for like five dollars. I got oh. it. I took it home, and gonna understand when I got. I was probably about twelve years old, so this would have been like 2004 when I got a used copy of Morrowind, maybe 2005. And I didn't know the gaming industry or the politics of gaming like I do now. I didn't even know who Bethesda was. So my impression of Morrowind upon playing it was the, that the game was horrible. Like I thought it was like a cheap, generic <laughs> B game mm-hmm. uh, because I didn't understand it. Um, so I, I bought it, yeah. played it for a bit, hated it, sold it. Uh, but then I got Oblivion on the 360 because it was like, oh, HD consoles, huge RPG for the 360. And I got the I got Oblivion. This is where I'll, I'll make the story quick is mm. I ended up buying and selling Oblivion five different times over the course of would have been from 2007 to 2011. So, so, so four you, years. So you sold it, rebought it, sold it, rebought it, sold it, rebought it. Like good. And, and not in this way. And now I have in my life sold things like because I was dumb and I was like, Oh, I'm bored of this game. Like I love, sure, like I yeah. say, I, it's like I say, Oh, I'm going to trade in my copy of ODST cause I'm done playing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then I buy it back because I'm like, Oh, I want to play it again. Yeah. But that wasn't this. This was like a, everyone says this game's amazing. The scores are great. I buy it, I play it, I try, 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 try. I hate it, yeah. and I'd be like, "Well, I'm just gonna get, I'm gonna get trading credit for it." And maybe, maybe four times, maybe not five, but I did four different times probably. Mm. Um, and I never liked it. And then eventually, I got to, uh, you know, the Skyrim like trailers were out and the release date, yeah. and I was like, I told my brother, I'm like, "You gotta help me get into this thing, please." And my brother <laughs> sat my with hand. Me. <laughs> Yeah, which I told on the on the our main show, Sacred Icon show. Yeah. Um, I was like, help me get into this. And uh I eventually got into Oblivion after doing the main story and and, con- and contracting vampirism. And I really was like, Oh, I love Oblivion. And I did all the DLC and had a great time. So and Oblivion is still my favorite Bethesda game today. Yeah. Um, but so that's kind of our origin story. So my first question for you, Joe, is and I wonder if you agree with this or not. So when Skyrim was coming out, slash when it did come out. Mm. I saw Bethesda as one of the most premier, best developers on the planet. Like, I'm not saying they were the best, number one, but they were probably top five or top ten. Like, they were like, mm, pre- premium. And I looked at them and I just saw quality. Is mm. that where you were too? At yeah, Skyrim? 100%. Okay. Um, I, 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 I was there with yeah. Fallout 3 and stuff. Like, I remember playing, yeah, I, like, just the yeah. vibe of Fallout 3. Obviously, I know, like, sort of aforementioned 
sort of i had no level of predication in, in in terms of what actually like came before it and stuff so i was like mm -hmm. what is this and just like i, I mean i i listened to the is it, is it, it's the fallout episode you've just done where joshy yeah uh, just does his backstory on getting into bethesda games right as well like he yeah. he very much similar to me is like oh the, the, where's where's three come from where's one and two you know? yeah yeah um, i didn't know what fallout was at the time yeah exactly a lot of us didn't um and so yeah it's um it's one of those things where like yeah i think at the time fallout 3 skyrim oblivion like those are the those are the trifecta at that point you know it was like oh my god like they're on a they're on a rampage right now through the industry making these amazing like state-of-the-art western rpgs so yeah I, I agree yeah um so i think that was kind of the general consensus from everyone back then right it was just like and, and i agree with yeah. i said skyrim is kind of the because skyrim skyrim is like the climax right that's it's why i chose skyrim it's, yeah, it's, the, it's the safest opus. point yeah to, to reference but yeah most people felt that way with, with oblivion and in like fallout 3 and stuff like that um but then there I mean, and honestly, honestly, all the way up through the release of Fallout 4, like the build up mm. to Fallout 4 yeah. um, to launch, I would say. Now, they were known for being extremely, releasing extremely buggy games. Mm -hmm. And I know that there was like, especially the people who could only play Bethesda games on PS3. It was like, your games don't even really work. Oh, when dude. I them. Like, some people could not like, literally play them because they were that broken. Bro, I got like with the Fallout show, I wanted to go back and play New Vegas, right? And I'm glad I didn't because like right now I'm literally playing Fallout One. Shout out to Chaosmatic77 in the in the Discord because his playthrough on, on his YouTube channel is inspiring me right now. Um, but like, dude, like I went and looked at like the Fallout New Vegas on the PlayStation Store, thinking there was like maybe a PS4 version of it or something. I saw the PS3 tag. I was like, I ain't touching that with a ten foot barge ball, yeah. dude. Because those games, the way it utilizes the RAM with like the physics instances and stuff, which just it wasn't good. Even Skyrim, like everything was so laggy all the time. So yeah, I. Yeah, it kind of just felt like it was it was almost if you only had a PS3, you kind of had to ask yourself, like, do I want to buy a Bethesda game yeah. here because it's the only way I can play it or do I just not play it at all? Like they low key just shouldn't have even released on those systems. I mean, it was a way for them to make money and sell mm -hmm. enough copies to. to, to fund and it was stuff. one of those things where like a lot of people obviously associate Oblivion. So Oblivion was a timed exclusive for a long time on the on the Xbox 360. Am I correct? Oblivion, yeah, it was like at yeah. least a year, if not. So, two. like a lot of people associate like obviously Bethesda slash Elder Scrolls, rightfully so, with Xbox. But I honestly think because well, Morrowind biggest... was a complete console exclusive. Yeah, exactly. And I honestly think like aside from the exclusivity side of it, I honestly think the optimization and where like that market share was when it came to who was playing on what platform for the Bethesda games, that's also like a subtle kind of inspiration to why people think that way even now. You know. Well, let's not forget Bethesda; they're a PC developer 100%. company. Yeah. And, and and Microsoft was PC, so it was like a perfect marriage, you know. 100%. And eventually, of course, you know, PS when PS4 came out, Sony finally, you know, got away from their hubris a little bit, and PS4 oh. is much more resemblant of like a, a 86 architecture like PC, mm -hmm. so it was able to be able to be developed for. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so would you be in agreement with me that like you know, barring the them being known for buggy games and stuff like that, like the cracks began to show when Fallout 4 released. Yeah, I, would you say that's yeah. correct? Like the thing with with Bethesda is like they've always been like a, a studio that develops power fantasy RPGs uh, for some first and foremost. And while like their games have never been on the narrative scale or the RPG like depth and dexterity of of like a CRPG or something at the time, it was still like mind blowing how like the breadth of the experience they offered, uh, and also while including obviously pretty decent narrative experiences alongside that. And yep. so yeah, hundred percent. Like obviously, it wasn't none of them was perfect, even in this time where it was their golden era. But at the same yep. time, like for the most part, like you said, the massive chinks in the armor started to show as soon as Fallout Four released, because in many ways that game was developed in a bubble, in many ways in a vacuum. And you can tell when you play it. Yeah, I I, I agree with what you're saying 100. percent I, I it's it's kind of hard to to quantify what what we mean by that, but it just I don't know. There's like the Skyrim came out in 2011. They worked on DLC for a year or so, yeah. and then you get Fallout 4 in 2015. So it was probably less than four years of development, mm -hmm. and it doesn't. It feels reflected in the in the game itself. Yes. Like it doesn't feel like it has that full. I wonder how much time was spent just, you know making it like in a new it's still the same engine but like updating the engine mm -hmm. and just making it look more beautiful because it's on next gen hardware because yep. it feels lacking in other ways but okay so when when fallout 4 comes out did you get it at launch yeah i got it at launch I, and I, I remember i remember playing it at launch like this was like my kind of this is my quick breakdown of how i how i 
experienced Fallout 4 in kind of that sort of not day one window, but like that whole year of 2015 is like I I played Fallout 4, I beat it, and I was like, this is really fucking good. Because just like the game in many ways, I was in my own little vacuum in terms of like what I have to compare it to. And obviously within the hype cycle of, of, of a game and stuff. And then like I played Metal Gear Solid 5 and like that's not a relevant game at all. But like I start to see kind of like how games have started to develop in terms of like mechanical complexity. Right. And then uh, and also like technological side, because that game runs at 60 frames, even on the eighth generation platforms. Yeah. At like perfect resolution. And it's so beautiful, that game. And then oh, and then and then I played The Witcher 3. And as soon as I played The Witcher 3, it was like, oh, shit. Like, I, I never said, like, Fallout 4 was a bad video game, but I remember, like, looking back at, it, back, back at it and going, whoa, like, what's happened here? Because, like, yeah. at the time, like, people, like, think, because I, like, read all the books for The Witcher and stuff, like, I got into The Witcher series via the books and everything, and I had all that preconceived, like, notion. I didn't. I was like everyone else. I got into The Witcher with The Witcher 3 and went backwards, just like I did with Fallout. And it was like, oh, my God, who is this developer? And and that was the point where, like, I think for me personally, Bethesda just started to kind of fall to pieces in my mind, so. Well, they were knocked off their, I mean, because, like, Fallout 4... See, that's the thing, like, like you talk about. So I remember 2015 pretty vividly. You had Bloodborne at the beginning of the year. Then mm -hmm. you had Witcher 3 and Arkham Knight. Then you had, at, at the end of the year, you had Halo 5 and Fallout 4. So it was a lot of games I cared about. Um, <clears throat> and the thing is, is everyone was looking forward to Fallout 4. Like, there was rumors. It was pretty much rumored, like, you know, we were going to see Fallout 4 in the summertime mm -hmm. with an announcement date for that fall. Because prior to the summer, we didn't even know for, we didn't have confirmation fallout 4 was coming we just pretty much all knew it and then in the summertime bethesda comes out says fallout 4 is coming out yep. in like four months get hyped here's the pit boy collector's edition all that stuff and um but i think the 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 idea was uh, witcher 3 is this game coming out in the summer mm -hmm. it's this rpg from a, a studio that's that's liked but not huge and you know they put out double a couple a, witcher games yeah double yeah a. by exactly uh, they put out a couple games before that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, were liked, but no, nothing, you know, blew up. And I think the expectation was like, you know, the RPG of this year is going to be Fallout 4. Yeah. Well, we play Witcher 3 in the summer of 2015 and everyone's just like, uh, what? Like, is this yeah. is this the best RPG ever? Is this one of the best games <laughs> yeah. ever made? Yep. Um, like, why is every quest so damn good? Why are why is every, the writing so amazing? But I think there was still like a thought in the air that, mm -hmm. well, when you know, Fallout 4 comes out later this year, it will be the better game, right? Yeah, because, yeah. I mean, these are the people that put out Skyrim. And I think when you get to Fallout 4, I think there's many reasons why Fallout 4 could be seen as disappointing by someone. But I think, you know, you play Fallout 4 and and you probably don't realize it immediately, but after a while you go, this is operating on a completely different level yeah. than Witcher 3. Like, Witcher 3 is like, an example of a team like at their peaks, uh, you know, just striving yeah. at 11 out of 10 at all times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you have Fallout 4, which is like uh, a, a great game um, made by a studio that's made better before. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of decisions that were made that, you know, different people have different opinions. Like I know for me and for a lot of people, like, you know, voice protagonist wasn't feeling that, mm -hmm. you know, way less options for your character, way less RPG like stuff in the game. It was more heavier on like shooting and looting. And um, but and, and I remember like 2015, it was such a good year for games, but I was so disappointed because like I was disappointed in Arkham Knight because I didn't think it was good as the prior Batman games. Uh, I was disappointed in Halo Five because I was like, "This is awful." I thought yeah, at the time yeah. Halo Five, and then I played Fallout Four, and I remember playing Fallout Four and having a great time. Like right from the beginning, I mean, I played it. I know life did that 50, 60 hours. I played it, and uh, I had a blast. And I never yeah. was really thinking about the game being bad in any way while I played it. I was thinking mm -hmm. this is another great Fallout game, and I think it's kind of once you finish it and you you've done the main story with the Institute and you've kind of done some of the side stuff and you thought about your experience. And you also think about how you felt playing Skyrim and Fallout three in New Vegas. And you're like, man, this really didn't hit that great for me. Like I can tell it's good, but I'm like, it's yeah. kind of like worse than the other ones. The other Bethesda games I've played, if not like yeah. my least favorite, I think or you want to say something, Joe, I yeah, think, I think fallout four in many ways, just like, even though like when you're in the moment and you're playing it and you're going through the motions and you're actually enjoying it in the moment, it, it it kind of it, it's good like it's really good like it's a great game i'd give up give it objectively like an eight out of ten i don't think you can go any lower than that same anyways. same um but i think once you move away from it it kind of you, you don't really think about it that much and yeah. i think new vegas and three 
uh, were very much Lasting the games impressions. that were like, oh my god, this is this is pretty fucking dope. Like those games have their problems for sure, but like, yeah, you know, like everyone remembers Mr. House and the various quest line sort of butterflying effects that go on in New Vegas, and you know, well, even I think you have two you have two halves, right? Because I feel mm. like New Vegas has the writing mm-hmm. and like the big story stuff that's like yeah, whoa. Yeah. But then Fallout 3 has like, wow, the world building. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I feel like the environments and the capital wasteland is much more of like an imposing presence across the board. Um, again, th- th- there's nuance to every single one of those points yeah. we've just made in terms of like the negatives of the exploration of the capital wasteland. But yeah, dude, I, I think I think Fallout 4, just because I think I think the fact that they clearly upgraded the creation engine between obviously New Vegas and 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 Four, so that obviously took a massive amount of development out of it. Um, there was Fallout Four is the first point in their sort of Fallout uh, own universe, in my opinion, that is like them fully homogenizing it in their own style. Like everything you see in the Fallout, like this TV is a full show, Bethesda game. Yeah, I feel like in, three leaned into like, well, here's some of the past as well. Exactly. Yeah. And and this is the thing. And the Fallout Four does some like pretty incredible stuff with that. Like like de- the Death Claws, for instance. I love the Death Claw designs in Fallout mm. Four and even seventy six. Like it's dope. Yeah. Like the size of them, the presence, the way they move and stuff is so cool. Like it's not goofy like in the originals. And then the power armor and stuff being like a more of a vehicle thing is dope as shit. And again, but- all of this is in the series. So oh. You say in this though, what's interesting, I think was a, was a big negative is like fallout four <clears throat> introduces you in the first hour of gameplay to getting the full mm-hmm. set of power armor and fighting the death claw. There's it's a, like, there's a, whoa, let's yeah. not blow the whole thing there's here a, right at the beginning. Yep. Yeah. There's a caveat. Uh, and th- this is the thing with like, for me, every Bethesda game, like it, it feels like there's always this big caveat, especially I think elder scrolls is a stronger series when, he, when, when I talk about caveats with their games, but like fallout, yeah. there's always something that's kind of like, Oh, that's a bit like, that's just like either blown the load too early in fallout four or there's like I said, exploration issues or, or whatever, you know? So, um, yeah, it's uh, it it was a weird game because in many ways it, it focused more on the shooting side of, of of the the games that came before you know and and obviously the RPG side of things went by the wayside massively, um, yeah. and it just felt aside from Far Harbor the DLC for Fallout Four it just felt very like run of the mill and it didn't feel very special it didn't feel like an evolution yeah. of of uh not necessarily fallout's rpg formula but i would say bethesda's rpg formula at all in many ways it it was a regression and i think a lot of people was were wanting kind of maybe an improvement to the gameplay for sure definitely no doubt like me personally like if they carried on with the fallout new vegas like style of shooting and fallout 3 style of shooting it wouldn't have done well but i think i think that they just massively truncated like the the meat and potatoes of what fallout 4 was but yeah I, i don't know if you've got anything to say on that no, I mean, no, I'm completely in, in agreement with you. And I think that then that puts us in an interesting spot because you go, that's 2015. And, and I think the the biggest benefit I can say, you know, for this point for Bethesda is I don't think, well, of course, there's always hyperbolic people online and haters and whatnot. But I feel like in general, broadly speaking, when we go into 2016 after Fallout 4 uh, has released, the general consensus is still Bethesda is one of the best in the game, right? Like they put out Skyrim, mm-hmm. they put out you know, Fallout 3, Oblivion, Morrowind, uh, that Fallout 4 was another great game, but maybe it let a lot of people down. Maybe it was disappointing. Maybe it wasn't the best Fallout, but everyone still kind of felt like, hey, this was uh, this was a good game, you know? And But I think people were also starting to see a little bit of, like like you said, the cracks starting to show, like, okay, yeah, yeah. you know, this is the same engine, and, like, the, this isn't their their peak of writing. This isn't their, what they can do as far as, like, the depth of an RPG. Um, and then a couple years later, you know, there's this whole thing on Twitch where they're like counting down to a release of a to an announcement of a new game, and they're mm. putting like a Vault Boy up, and they're they're doing all this Fallout related stuff. And I remember standing there in, in my brother's room when this is going on, and I'm like, I'm scratching my head. I'm like, how can this be a Fallout game announcement? Like, okay, we got <laughs> yeah, we got Elder Scrolls Oblivion, we got Fallout Three, then we got um, well, yeah, yeah, we got then we got Skyrim. Mm. And then we got Fallout 4. Mm-hmm. Next comes Elder Scrolls, right? And it's like, well, they're they're teasing another mm-hmm. Fallout game. And uh, then they announced it's Fallout 76. And it was like, what is this? And mm-hmm. I remember my brother getting pretty hyped, but it was also like, oh, there's like murmurings that this could be multiplayer. And I don't want, and, you know, a lot of people are like, I don't want a multiplayer Fallout. I want a single player thing. And lo and behold, when it gets to E3 time, 
the show Fallout 76 is going to be, oh, it's it's totally the the same single player yeah, Fallout, yeah. you know, <laughs> but you can bring a friend along if you want, uh, or you can just play solo. And uh, the game came out, and it was clearly a multiplayer online game design first and foremost. Yeah. It was not designed around a single player experience. Even though you was, could do it. It wasn't. You could do it, it but wasn't that was not, it. How it was, not how it was meant to be experienced at all. There was no NPCs oh. in the game. Uh, it was buggy. It was broken. There was server yeah. issues. And the special edition uh, actually... Now, I I feel like some people will think that this was like an overreaction, but I think it's pretty fair. They marketed, and I'm probably going to get it wrong, they marketed a special bag that the 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 power armor helmet would come in yep. for the special edition. Mm-hmm. Yep. And the bag was supposed to be like this really like nice canvas bag. Like there was pictures of it nope. and everything. And they literally just shipped people this super cheap nylon bag yep. that wasn't like it wasn't like they you know the picture had a blue canvas bag and you got a red one it was like this is obviously not the same product they said that we were getting so they had to make that right and the game was just a huge or the the it was a huge shit show yeah and so at this point it looks like okay we have fallout 4 that came out and it was a good game but it was lackluster from what we expect from bethesda couple years later they turn around with another fallout game again already that's online only that's broken that doesn't work for shit you know poor advertising poor marketing and uh then and then so like at this point i mean bethesda's reputation is just completely at all the goodwill of skyrim yep pretty much plummeted all it takes is all it takes is one mistake dude one yeah mistake. I, I mean, that's the thing is like fallout 4 wasn't a mistake but it was like okay the ice is starting to melt just a little bit Mm-hmm. And then when you get to Fallout 76, it's like, okay, well, the whole pond is just broken now. The yeah. ice is just completely shattered. Um, so 70, that puts them in a bad spot. And then it's around this time, maybe a little bit before, maybe a little bit after, there's there's the the leak murmurings of like, well, they're working, their next game, their next single player game they're working on is a space, uh, a space Bethesda game, a new IP. Fallout in space. Um, Fallout in space. And I remember it was pretty early on too that it leaked that like, I, I you know, I remember reading leaks. It's like, we think the name is Starfield and Eventually, they did announce it. When they announced it, it was very much just a, like, here's a splash image. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the game's called Starfield. It's our mm-hmm. first new IP. It's in space. And I think for, e- even though, like, Fallout 4 had been a little lackluster and 76 was awful, I think a lot of people, including myself, were like, okay, if they can pull off, like, Skyrim quality game in space, holy shit, this could be next level. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're talking about, I mean, we're talking about, like, 2017, 2018, we know about the existence of Starfield. We didn't get this game till 2023, guys. So like, yeah, it, took ages. It, it felt like it was long in the tooth. I got to admit, because it was always yes. like, like, the, and then they had that little cutscene of like the, the the eye or whatever it's called. That's just outside of Earth, not Earth. Oh uh, yeah, what's yeah, the planet? Yeah. Like Earth, the new Earth in talking. the game. Yeah, but yeah, like uh, that's part of Constellation. It was just like, okay, so we've got that. That's good. And and then it was like, then there was I think there was leaked images of the spaceship, right, and stuff like that, and like mm-hmm. someone walking around it. It was like. Okay, yeah. that's that's fine, but like, come on, like, like if this is your next game, hurry, hurry up, you know? Yeah, and, so. and then once they actually got to the point where they decided to like show the game a bit, the first time they showed it off properly, uh, the frame rate was all over the place mm-hmm. in the gameplay. The gameplay that they chose to show us was the frame rate was all over the place, and the game looked good and fun, but mm-hmm. it it didn't do much to elicit any excitement. I remember if you go back way back, probably two three years at this point. Uh, me and Josh saying on the podcast, like, I don't really know what there is to be so excited about Starfield other than it's a Bethesda single player game, right? They haven't really shown us much. Yeah. And I don't think there was a lot of hype for Starfield for a while. And then we got the showcase last year, uh, mm. summer of 2023. We got like 45, 50 yeah, minutes straight. Direct, yeah. And, and the way that they, they marketed it, the way they showed off gameplay, the things you could do, they just nailed it. They showed so much content. It looked great. It looked like, and then they were talking about like, you know, stuff feels like Oblivion and like they had to zoom into the face again, mm-hmm. like from like Oblivion and like, it really felt like, oh man, like classic Bethesda might be coming back. The hype for Starfield was unreal. And I think anybody who wasn't paying attention to the Starfield hype, I mean, this was only a year ago we're talking about. Yeah. I mean, this um, was 10 months ago, this, this, uh, the initial trailer, the official gameplay trailer. And then obviously the, uh, like you said, the summer one was a bit later. So yeah, exactly. So like, if you weren't paying attention, um, well, I'll just we'll just tell you now. Like, there was some serious hype for Starfield, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And, and leading all the way up to launch. And also, this was going to be this was the first big AAA game that Microsoft has put out as an exclusive on their platform after acquiring a bunch of studios. You know, they did this big sweep where they purchased all these studios: uh, Obsidian, In Exile, um, oh. 
what's another one they I mean obviously Bethesda but like a couple other studios that they purchased yeah. and uh compulsion they like compulsion yeah. yeah but and they'd put out like you know there's like the grounded grounded was yeah, out yeah. and Five City, like yeah. little stuff like that but we had yet to see what a big AAA yeah. release from Microsoft exclusive would be here and you start like this is another it. thing like you just had uh Arcane's game flop Redfall like so yeah, you Redfall just had that come out so like that worked in a very weird way because like it was kind of like a knock to the confidence of what like, Bethesda could do with Starfield slash Xbox could do with Starfield and also at the same time it was kind of like all hands are on deck everything is on Starfield so it was kind of like this weird like juxtaposition of like kind of expectations where like people were kind of down and out on it because of Arcane uh, yeah. like kind of dropping that game like in a weird in a weird state and then you also had like you know, and then you also had the people that were super hyped for starfield and, and all had like i said all hands on deck so it was it was a really weird time for starfield in many ways because it was like all all eyes were on it it was it was just like right okay it, it really was weird because redfall and starfield are both published by bethesda but mm-hmm. only starfield is developed by bethesda yep. and they're both owned by microsoft and they're mm-hmm. both big exclusives for the year so yeah it was like Okay, well, that game sucked, and that's bad. That's not good news, but like, well, Starfield, this is actually from Bethesda, and it's mm-hmm. been a long time. Uh, and then the game, you know, the game comes out in September, and the reviews, I mean, like, let's be honest, I mean, the reviews were really good yep. across the board. Um, there was there were some 10s, there was some 9s, there was, I'd say, mostly, I'd say most of the thing scores fell in around the 8 area. Yeah, 8, 8, 8, 8 was your average, yeah. Um, there was some some sevens, notably the IGN seven that got everyone just completely <laughs> flustered. Like how is this, like yeah, like how is this possible? That Starfield could be yeah. a seven. Game Spot gave it a seven, right? I think so. And then there was yeah. some crazy ones that were just way out there. You know, sixes and fives. And I know like the Jimquisition uh. was like a four. And but ultimately, you know, it, it settled around mid eighties on Metacritic, and and most of the scores were eight or higher. And um, when the game came out. Dis- it, it, the 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 general conversation about it was was really great too. Like people were just like, "Oh my gosh!" You know, I ran into this thing in my spaceship, and mm. I ran across this thing on the planet, and everyone was really excited. I know in our Discord, uh, I'm talking about the general consensus. I'm talking about YouTube and big mm-hmm. publications and stuff. But in our Discord, I mean, I know a lot of us in there were like, I mean, even Joe himself here was like, "Oh, this is so cool! This is yeah. fun! I I'm playing a lot of Starfield," and uh, everyone was really feeling it. A lot of people in our community had it, um, and then I'd say about. I don't know, roughly two weeks after it mm. launched, there's starting to be a lot of like, mm, I don't know about this. Mm, I don't know about yeah. that. Mm, yeah. Criticism about this. And I don't know how this is setting. And um, I was definitely, I mean, I was one of the people spearheading that uh, yeah, discussion in our it. community because I was like, oh, this is like, this is good, but like this, this <laughs> is sometimes great, but this isn't amazing. And this is really like flawed yeah. here. And this is a step back we're here. And then, and then I think Joe was just like, well, I agree. And Brian's popping off. So I'm just going to pop off too. And then Joe was talking about like, <laughs> you were loving that shit, bro. <laughs> you know, uh, all the problems. And like, yeah, me and Joe definitely like, despite yeah, us both saying the game. <laughs> yeah. So the, he, he should not be named. Right. When you think about it, like, the funny thing is, is like Diente, Diente is obviously the biggest person in the community who, who, who loves oh yeah loves Starfield the most. I mean, he says it's his favorite game of all time. Period. Wow. Um, above before he had uh, Kingdoms of Amalar, Reckoning, and ODST up there, but he Starfield passed them both for him. Damn. Um. So yeah. So like, but but we we were kind of like you know, me and Joe were like crapping over it a lot, but like I don't feel like I, to be fair, I don't feel like we were just straight up crapping over it. I felt like we were offering genuine criticisms of it, but we were definitely reveled in the fact that like, yeah. come on, guys, like. Can you not see the issues here, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> there was but, level, uh, level both, of cathartic nature with that critique and that was going on for sure. Yeah, for sure. And uh, you and I both thought it was objectively an eight. We both thought mm-hmm. it was a good game. You know, I think for me, subjectively, I was still kind of at that eight, but you were like much lower, kind of like seven, I six. Actually, like you, I think I remember yeah. saying to you, I started at a nine, objectively. Yeah. I think I remember saying that to you, I was like, this this is a nine. Like, it's a great game. And I think yeah. for the first 20 to 30 hours of Starfield, I think it's there. I really do. I think you can you can go as far as a nine. And I think for the maybe first 10 to 20, I, I, I don't necessarily agree with it, but I feel like you could subjectively say it's a 10. Like, it has a very strong okay. start in many ways. Like, you know, with the planets and the scale of everything seemingly so and the way the ships are and stuff. It's just, it's very cool and it's the best shooter combat that like bethesda have put out or combat in general well the melee is a bit weird but the the shooter combat is is definitely the best they've ever done and i think that um but like as you said like as i played and the longer i got into my playthrough it started to drag dude and i ended up having obviously objectively i still stayed on an eight 
no doubt in my mind I'm still there but I think subjectively I went from that nine subjective and objective score to the subjective start to drop to like a six seven out of ten depending on what like what mood you catch me in when I talk about yeah. it uh so yeah it's it's interesting you say that because I one thing I really agree with and one thing I don't so I think that the first five to ten hours of Starfield's pretty weak because not because mm -hmm. the world doesn't draw you in not because it's not cool and fun but and I I I thought you maybe were already aware of this, Joe. This is probably one of the most common criticisms of Starfield mm -hmm. is like it's so slow mm -hmm. uh starting starting up and introducing all the systems. It doesn't really explain them. Uh there's not really a, a step out moment like you'd picture leaving the vault or yeah, I know all that. you know, like the dragon, you know, coming mm -hmm. in Skyrim and you're about to get your head chopped off and all that stuff. Like there's not really a a, a moment that kind of signifies like you've arrived. And it, like I said, it's slow. It's like, it doesn't really explain all the ship stuff. It doesn't really explain all the weapons and the menus. And of course, yep. because of the ship and like leaving planets and stuff, there's lots of loading, there's lots of menus. And it's like, I think it's pretty rough starting, but I think there's a point somewhere between five and 10 hours in where you start to understand it and get it. And it becomes really fun and really exciting. Mm -hmm. And then the part where I really agree with Joe is, I think what happens is, is they're like, when you start Starfield, there's so much there and you mm -hmm. haven't discovered it yet. And you're just, it's just all coming at you. And it's, and a lot of it's good and a lot of it's fun, but it, it feels so overwhelming, like all the good and fun that's just coming at you. And I think once you've experienced enough of the good and the fun, yeah, as the hours start to accrue, you start to feel like that you're not doing as much as you thought you were. Mm. And in my opinion, I know not everyone will agree the it, it, the universe of starfield started to become that very like popular phrase of like as wide as an ocean but as deep, deep as, as a puddle. as a puddle yeah because like when i entered it i was mm. like oh my gosh when i first started playing starfield i'm like i got the whole universe here yeah there's a thousand planets it very there's, much feels like no man's sky just a triple triple a level like yeah yeah you're like there's there's multiple ships i can get i can make yeah. my own ships there's there's different factions. There's like, I can build bases. I can get companions. I can build relationships with them. And you're just like so overwhelmed. And I think, I think it takes like that. I think, think it takes probably 40, 50 hours to kind of see all of that stuff mm. start to get exhausted. Like, okay, I've done some companion stuff. Yep. I've done some factions. I've went to a bunch of planets. I've fixed my ship. I've done this. I've done that. I built some bases and you start to get to like, okay, now that I've done all that, like I've only explored maybe 27 planets. I know there's mm. a thousand but let me go explore 20 more just for the sake of it. And you start to see like, well, the 20 more I explored was not a lot different yeah. than the 27 I'd already explored. Mm -hmm. And there's no more companions left for me to get. I've already done their stuff. Uh, I've done all the factions. So those aren't really there anymore. Every planet I go to is procedurally generated. And like, maybe there's some like, maybe some like new sites to see, but it's mostly just like some creatures and like creatures a base or that I've some seen like before. empty station or yeah, yeah. some band like radar. Uh, crimson raider like fucking areas or whatever exactly yeah. or you'll or, or mm. something or a or a, a ship will land and a guy will yeah. get out to fight you and you're like oh yeah, man yeah. you know and and i think it gets to the point where you're just like okay like a lot of this was so cool and so fun and so overwhelming but once you've done it all it it you, what felt like this huge ocean it feels like you've you've I just feel like you've consumed most of it already. Mm. And it's like, there's so much left, but what's left doesn't really matter. Mm. You know? And I remember like, I'd run into the grandma in, in space. I ran into her like oh, over yeah. and over again. Oh, so really? Like, past the first time, it was not that interesting. So the thing, you know, the grandma with me, yeah. I only ran into her once, like towards the end of my playthrough. I ran into her like four times. And the the thing about it is, because like, obviously everyone's talking about Starfield, I instantly knew who she was and I knew who she was referencing and stuff, like the, the Skyrim grandma and stuff. And it was like- Oh, I wondered if that's, yeah, what that was. And it, and it was like, okay it didn't hit the yeah. same because obviously i kind of got spoiled i mean that's my fault for going on like twitter or something yeah. but like at the same time it's kind of like uh, okay it's kind of like how i yeah it's kind of like red dead 2 like if you guys have played red dead 2 you, you haven't brian right like you've not played red dead 2 at all i've like played like five hours but i don't know much okay. about it i mean i've looked up cutscenes and stuff but yeah so the way like red dead redemption 2 like not to tangent too hard but this is kind of like a, a comparison here when you play the open world like it's a very very detailed open world you can hunt fish you know uh go to bandit camps all sorts of stuff you know get loads of random encounters but there are like seven random encounters that you find on your way uh throughout this game and it's like i don't know one can be a guy gets bit by a snake or a guy gets his foot caught in a trap or a woman is trying to get to rob you or something like but the problem is is like when you play these on subsequent playthroughs they all are the same in many ways you kind of have like one or two ways to deal with them like you mm -hmm. can either uh i don't know like for the guy with the bear trap like you can get his foot out of the bear trap and then give him 
medical aid or whatever and then the yeah. snake bite you can suck the venom out or give him medicine for it and like they all have like this binary option to kind of go about the the, the completion and i feel like even though skyrim uh, skyrim starfield is in many ways like more in depth than that because it's an rpg and, it, and it's a lot more dynamic than than red dead is in that way when you kind of look at it in comparison to what everyone else is experiencing and you're all kind of experiencing the same thing in many ways that isn't like that open and it's all very similar it kind of feels like you're going on like on a ride over and over again uh, a theme park and it's yep. not very in depth um yep. so yeah no i mean i i mean i quit playing starfield at 70 hours and at 70 hours i'd done all the factions yep. um i had messed with building my ship i leveled my characters like level 40 and at that point, it was like, okay, well, there's no new factions to go track down, so I'm just going to go land on planets. Yes. And every time you're lo you're you're landing on planets, you're you're loading uh, your ship into space, you're loading your ship back into the world that you land on, mm -hmm. going into menus like crazy, and uh, the planets just felt barren or pretty boring and procedurally yeah. generated. And like, so it got to that point where it's like, it, the the pro is is like I put 50 hours into the game before I really felt any sense of boredom. Like 50 hours is it's a lot of time, but like, yeah, that was me just kind of exhausting most of the crafted content. Okay. And then yeah. what was left was this vast, like the, the 90% of the game that was left was the not crafted game. Mm. That was just samey stuff I'd already done. And it's like, well, if you've already done it and the best content's behind you and there's so much like loading and menus and stuff, it's like, I don't really want to keep playing. And I think one of the things that makes it, way different in any other Bethesda game was like, for instance, Fallout 4, you're you're just in one, you're just on one planet, right? You're in yeah. one area. So you may, by the time you beat all the factions, you may be at 200 hours of gameplay because as you traveled between each faction, you were running into random encounters, mm -hmm. random side quests, random characters going into caves and stuff. So like, yep. I mean, you could spend, if it's like a 10 hour main story, you could spend 47 hours in the main story because you're like getting distracted and stuff. Where, with Starfield, it feels more like, I mean, like there is, I'm not saying you can't get distracted in Starfield. I know I got distracted when I was doing, I was doing like the Crimson Fleet. Mm. And then I got distracted by starting the, uh, the U, what is it called? The UN, the one with the uh, aliens, the, the, the Terramorph quest, the Terramorph quest. Yeah. I, I started that. I got, I got caught up in that and I got sidetracked. But the thing is, for the most part in Starfield, it's like, go on your map and go to this planet where this quest is. And then. On that planet, we'll have a crafted area where the quest is, yeah. and then the, the planet you can go off to the non like crafted area. Yeah. But then it's basically just a bunch of blank planet behind yeah. the crafted area. So it's like so you kind of get in this point where like there's not so much of running into random things and getting pulled off sidetrack. It's more direct, and then the yeah. fact that you're constantly going in menus and loading makes it feel like separate. It doesn't feel like one big world because I mean, in a sense, like. The amount of crafted content in Starfield is probably pretty comparable to uh, prior Bethesda games, mm. but it's all, it feels very much like point A, point B, point A, point B, and that takes away so much from uh, yeah. from what Bethesda games are. I know for me, and, and this is probably where we can go, because we, we debated on it a bit in the Discord, um, for me, I, I just thought that Starfield had superior writing to Fallout 4. I thought it felt more like an RPG. Um, I liked that the character wasn't voiced. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I felt more, much more like I was in a role playing game when I played Starfield than I did Fallout Four. I think the, the the main story of Starfield. Not only do I think the main story of Starfield is more interesting than Fallout Four, I think it's the yeah. best main story in any Bethesda game, the Constellation storyline. And that's you know, it depends yeah. how you look at it. Because because on one hand, I don't think there's a super high bar there, right? Like it's not going to be yeah. Metal Gear Solid. Yeah, or something like that. Yeah, but at the same I, I time, agree. you know, yeah, I think it's the best one for sure. Yeah, I, I think that like to touch on kind of the way uh, Starfield approaches this kind of content and stuff. I think, again, it's, it's very much a comparison to Red Dead in many ways. I know Red Dead's not an RPG, but like it, it, it shares a lot of issues, sim similar issues. When you play Red Dead, you play the main narrative. It's kind of like you go to your quest mark, you start up the quest. And it's like kind of just normally you like ride with your posse. And then you get into a gunfight and then you have to follow like the yellow marker. It's, it's a lot of follow the yellow marker and there's no there's no like sense of like freedom with the way that that sort of uh, yeah. mission structure is like you, there'll be missions where you like you have to hide a, hide a stagecoach. But like if you don't hide it in a if you turn your minimap off, which has the yellow marker on, there's no other way to find it. If you if you turn your minimap uh, off and you try and hide it in a secluded area anywhere 
once you're out of combat it doesn't work like you have mm. to go to a specific place um but then that is juxtaposed in red dead in, in terms of when you play the free roam it's this very immersive sim like open yep. world that offers like a player choice driven in many ways ambient narrative or a set of ambient narrative uh scenarios and it, and it feels awesome to do that but you kind of got that two kind of player agency dependent and non-player agency dependent like design and it, and it kind of it, it bashes against each other more than yeah. i think people realize when they play the game um and it just makes it all feel a little bit weird and a little bit archaic and and the thing with starfield similar similarly is like i feel like that's kind of the same thing it, it's not as bad as as i think red dead suffers from but i think it i think it has a similar problem where like you've got all that open content and this is the weird thing about starfield you've got all that open world content and stuff that is you know akin to skyrim you know wandering the like the plains out there and finding caves and stuff like which is the best part of skyrim bearing in mind like picking up all these side quests picking up all the yeah. you know finding these raid camps, lost, stuff like that you know maybe picking up a bounty here or two you know like and that's like the best part of those games all the time. Same with the old Fallout games from Bethesda. Like that sort of... Because like in many ways, the main narratives in these games, they are, they're not shit, but they are there to, again, just give you that power. Means to an end. It's a means to an end. It's a yeah. vehicle for you to just kind of get in as you go through and like kind of get out of the pit stops and, and go, oh, that's a cool gas yeah. station or whatever. You know what I'm saying? So like... And it's weird that like Starfield has this really tight like sort of main narrative in many ways, this main focal point curated part of the content. Um, aside from if you're talking about the um, Ryujin Industries questline, because that is trash. But like, um, but it also again is juxtaposed by this like, oh yeah, but there's also like this other side of the game. In many ways, it's two very different identities of video game yeah. here. You've got that sort of curated stuff, and th which is for some reason the best part of this game in many ways yeah comparatively to like the other games where it wasn't necessarily um and yeah. then and then you you've also got like the procedural stuff and like kind of the tertiary stuff that used to be kind of the best part about skyrim and stuff like that yeah. um and they clash hard they against clash each other hard yeah. and, the, and the thing what you find when you play starfield is that in my in my particular case anyway is like I had no reason at all to stray from the quest lines that were given to me and no reason to like take yeah. in any of the ambient storytelling. Like there were some parts where I was like, oh shit, like there was one part where I, I don't know what planet I was on. I can't remember because they've all got random, random ass names, but it was like a moonlight planet, right? It was all rocks and shit. And I came to a, uh, I came to a cave and I think I said this on the Critical Frames podcast like way, way back um, last year, but I, I, I came to it and I was like, uh, there was like all these dead bodies outside not all these dead bodies but there's like a couple of scientists or whatever or spacefarers mm -hmm. and then like there was like an egg and stuff and i was like oh shit what is this what is this fucking thing and there was a cave nearby so i didn't take the egg because i thought like the egg was going to be like going to spawn something or whatever right yeah so i went into the cave and it's just like every other cave in starfield's planet right it's like that steamy yeah. like cave area with a couple of minerals and maybe a chest or whatever the fuck they have right that pile of dung so I came back out <laughs> and I took the egg. I was like, oh shit, right. So I'm, I like reloaded all my weapons. I got everything out. I like got everything ready. I was like, right, okay. I healed up, took the egg. And literally, I don't even know if it was, if it was scripted or not, but the same fucking enemies that I've been fighting on that planet for like fucking 30 minutes running in a straight line to this one quest line, uh, one, one marker on, on my compass was l like literally just rolled around the corner. And I was like, oh, that's it. And I, I, like i just remember feeling this like massive sense of just like mm -hmm. that's just destroyed all all sense of like what the fuck was that you know and though like i've said this yeah. before but those are the moments in rpgs that are like wow you know like those are the moments that like everyone talks about the water cooler effect the Elden ring shit and it this just happened to me yeah uh, yeah and, and i feel like i feel like most people who played enough of starfield like we all just had the same moments right like yeah. i mean most yeah. people met grandma uh, one of my, one of my favorite moments was when I met the uh, there was a ship in mm -hmm. space that was like a legacy okay. ship where a f where a family had uh, a family had left Earth and then the family you know the the parents got older and died and then their kids uh, took on over took on the, um, flying the ship and yep. just it was a legacy ship for them to travel through space and you find that and it's so neat but like everyone finds that right and mm -hmm. I'm not saying that like people didn't play Skyrim and Fallout and all find the same thing there either, oh yeah but there's just the fact that you're like zipping from point A to point B, um, you know, it kind of it kind of makes it feel like a, a completely different experience than prior Bethesda games. Mm. And, and I feel like obviously this would have made people more pissed, but like I can't help but feel like if like the exact game we got had just had like seven planets and those seven planets covered all the 
companion quest mm-hmm. factions, all the stuff. And it just kind of like ended once we did everything like, like, mm-hmm. a, like if it was just like a 70 hour RPG that was content full and yeah. then it didn't have this illusionary it was focused. procedural generation so, like yeah, that, it would that, feel more like yeah that dev yeah. time that was put into like those planets and yeah. stuff to like ape no man's guy in air quotes was put into like kind of the curated main shit that everyone kind of yeah i know because it, it feels very much to me like so much of the promise of this game was pointless to me like mm-hmm. i did get so much out of these quests and these characters and these fun gameplay moments yeah but but you're telling me I mean, if I want it, and I know that they don't intend for everyone to explore every planet, but like, let's say I just wanted to explore a third of the planet so sure. fully. We're talking about a multi hundred hour game. You could spend three, four, five hundred hours in this game. Yeah. And I would, t- I would say once you hit the one, I, probably earlier, but I'd say once you hit the one hundred hour mark, there's no curated content left for you to find no. probably earlier than a hundred I... and you, then you're just spending hundreds of hours on yeah. procedurally generated planets that don't have much to offer i know you can set up bases yeah i know you can scan uh like different like living creatures and, and add them to your log and what but mm-hmm. I'm like what is it all service and like when i set up these bases to get like materials what am i using the materials for like and even if you have like this ambition for this crazy ship you should be able to build ship with enough materials long before you've played four or 500 hours. Yeah. And like, it just doesn't, it just doesn't feel really like compelling or worth it. And when you look at something even like fallout four, which, you know, felt much less like an RPG to, to me, I feel, I feel like most people, I mean, fallout four still had like, here's the map. Here's mm-hmm. all these things that are like intertangled and working together and you can get distracted on your way to doing this and doing that. And like, yeah. Yeah, uh, it felt I more think, meaningful and more like their kind of content. Yeah, I th- I think with Starfield, the biggest problem with it is it's very gamified, uh, in the sense that which like, is you, you which is also it. what's kind of fun about it. At it's times. fun. Like this but, is the yeah. thing. Like the strongest element. This is the weird thing about Starfield. It's such an enigma to me. Like it's the strongest part of Starfield is also its weakest part in many ways because, like you said, that first like. 10 15 20 hours or whatever like when you're kind of discovering everything and figuring out all the systems and it's all getting like thrown at you like a mile a minute i remember i was having this conversation in dms actually we were like talk we were, we were saying to each other like just that feeling of like uh like having all these different like little bits that you can like nibble away at so you can like mess yeah. with the mess with the spaceship mess with your your uh clothing uh you know find new weapons do the quest lines. like that all feels so fucking good um but the problem is, is like, as you go on, that sort of, the thing with Starfield is there's a lack of journey. There's a lot of destination in it, if you've noticed. Like when you when you jump to places, you're already at the destination. Uh, when you go, there's lots of loading screens. You're always in buildings, like instantly. There's no like, sort of like uh, chunk loading in many ways, like like Minecraft does where it like, you or Cyberpunk, where it's like everything's loaded as you go and stuff and it, and it feels like more dynamic. No, it's like yeah. you landed in this town. Now you want to go in the bar so you can open yep. the door and load. Yep, and it's, yeah. and it's instantly there. But the problem, and, and I think you touched on something really like pertinent with this. I think that like the most important thing when it comes to these large scale RPGs that you need is that you need the journey to be so important. And even if that journey is literally just you wandering across wasteland, like in yep. Fallout for ages and shooting a couple of like roaming bandits or whatever, and maybe hopping into like a gas station and being like, oh, okay, I've got some new stim packs or whatever. Even if it's just that micro little activity that isn't even pertaining to any level of side quest or anything, those things are so important because it just like, it gives, I think the world a sense of scale and it gives like your journey a sense of like reverence and gravitas. Uh, you feel like you're really doing something. Exactly. Where if I'm constantly in orbit or yep. in menus or in loading screens, I feel like my time's being wasted and I can't imagine in 70 hours of play, I feel like it, it's not crazy for me to say that near 10 hours of my 70 hours was spent in yep. loading screens like or going in and out of orbit or menus, you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's just, so then like, okay, to, to sum up this part of the conversation, Joe, yeah, you you think Fallout 4 is the superior game to Starfield, right? I don't know. Personally? If, I think objectively, I think they're both neck and neck. I really do. Okay. I okay. think this, I subjectively, I prefer Fallout 4. Okay, and and I think in you haven't said this yet, but I, I agree with your point. I think Joe's big point is like any of the faults that Fallout 4 had, it got to have those faults in 2015. Starfield is still having a similar amount of faults, but it's now 2023. So it's yep. like, okay. And, and you were trying to make that, you were making that point in the Discord where it's like, yeah, they most both have problems, but like this game still has the problems and it's another eight years in the future. Yes. Which I think that is true. And I also agree with that. But I do think for me, I feel like 
Starfield steps it up in enough areas to where it does oh. kind of bring it to that even keel level that Fallout 4 is out. I think there's just going to be different preferences for for different people, but I think it, it's, it's in the air that most Bethesda fans can kind of agree, like, we still haven't arrived at a Skyrim level Bethesda yet, right? Like, Fallout 4 wasn't it. Starfield wasn't it. Like, we haven't got back to how like, good oh, Skyrim was. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah like, like, we, we we've been there. <laughs> like We've yeah. been there, but we haven't yeah. we haven't got back to that, right? And yeah. then, so then that would bring me to you know, my next question, which is like, okay, we know that the next Bethesda game is Elder Scrolls. That's what they've said. Mm. I mean, they announced it with a PNG like what, four or five years ago at this point already. Um, <laughs> that trailer. But, yeah, so Elder yeah. Scrolls, like, I'm not, you know, trying not to be pessimistic. I mean, no matter what, the next Elder Scrolls is not coming out earlier. In my mind, it's coming out like 2028 at the earliest. Mm -hmm. But I guess if someone wants to say 2027 or something, may, I've heard people say 2026, and I don't see it possible in my head. I do, I do not see so, it possible. But it's years away, regardless. So, given um, okay, yeah. the latest news, have you heard the latest news on Fallout since the TV show? Uh, about there's like two projects or whatever. No, what you're gonna say okay, Xbox. Go Xbox are like kind of pushing Bethesda to yeah fast track. I don't know Fallout what that 5. means though. Yeah, I've heard like, that. But so like I mean, you could be getting a Fallout Five before you get a Skyrim, uh, the Skyrim no, Two they, or whatever. No, I mean they've already confirmed that several times. Like they uh, they already said they already said that uh, Elder Scrolls uh, Six was in a playable had a playable state of some sort. Which when they said that, my mind was like, okay, you have like a gray stick moving in a gray block is probably what you mean <laughs> yeah but yeah. like but like they've they've made it clear and also like, okay. let's not forget how let's not forget how huge of a seller skyrim was and that we were sitting at uh we're going on was this 14 years yep since skyrim mm -hmm. uh which is Th early 13? 13 actually it's 13. 13 years yeah 13 which is insane so the next elder scrolls best case scenario three four five years from now mm. when we get that game joe this is a multi-tiered question what do you think it'll be like and do you think it will? Do you think they'll be able to get back to their their roots, but also evolve it forward? Like how how successful do we think Elder Scrolls will be? I think we're both. I think we can just get this out of the way. We both know it's going to be extremely successful. It's going to be extremely hype. It's going to sell like crazy. People are people are going to be very happy to get the game. But like, what are we looking at here? Are we looking at the next Elder Scrolls being like Fallout Four level? I mean, we know it's not going to be segmented by orbit and loading screens because mm. this is just going to be one you know it's going to be on one planet you know per se um but what's it going to look like joe are they going to advance it at all or is it going to feel like a redundant like just it's going to feel like just another skyrim it's like oh this is cool but we've already played it. are they going to have the typical like here's your main quest here's your dark brotherhood here's your that and then oh here's all the creation tools where you can build a settlement and stuff like are they going to push it forward or do you think it's going to be very because i could also see microsoft being like you know what do that thing you do with Fallout 4 and have like a three or three year, three, four year kind of turnaround, mm -hmm. you know, have this game out quicker. Um, how do you think it'll land, Joe? Elder Scrolls. I don't know, because like time has told us time like history is has taught us that Bethesda like just don't really want to change much. Like, yes, they change like I would say like key elements of their like sort of how would you say like gameplay loop in terms of like bringing it more back to the RPG stuff in Starfield as opposed to Fallout 4 and every game's improve improved the gunplay every uh, game I, I would, and, and combat yeah. just in general yeah. yeah I would say that but I think the main issues that plague I I think that Starfield is kind of a one and done thing when it came when it comes to the issues of, of Starfield I yeah, think I, I I think that you won't have like they're not going to repeat the mistakes of having empty desolate areas on Elder Scrolls Six. Mm. It's not going to happen because, yeah. like, how could they? They they That'd be they really have, bad because it's all one continuous place. Yes, so. and they have the template there for, from Skyrim. They just have to kind of implement the yeah. the, the gameplay advancements. But it, it, I say just as if it's easy when it's not. But I yeah. I think that like I think the issue you have is that it will probably st still be the same kind of Bethesda stuff you get. It will be obviously way more pretty advancements in the the melee combat and everything just like it was yeah. from oblivion to skyrim you know i think I, you're obviously going to get changes to the way the skill system works and everything just like it was from oblivion to, to skyrim again and i think you're going to get all those incremental improvements but i they are so dead set on staying and again we come back to this creation engine talk that everyone is kind of sick of at this point but 
I can't see them moving away from it. Like they are they in love. They can't. They are. They are in love with that creation engine, and they. Well, I don't think there's any other engine that can do it without being heavily modified and changed into something else entirely. No, nobody else in the industry does what they're doing. No, hundred percent engine. So, but yeah, I don't know. I the negative side of me, the the pessimistic side of me that you're catching me on right now, I can't see them changing much, and I feel like. From a like just from a technical side alone, I think you're still going to get the same problems. You're still going to get a buggy launch. You're still going to get like serious. Starfield issues. wasn't too buggy. No, but it was. It still had enough. <laughs> like I don't remember having too many myself. Person, um, I mean, I remember like talking to the back of a character's head. I had people I remember like, that. blowing through ceilings and shit. Mm. <laughs> like, okay. I, I yeah. lost people. Like they like. Key, key NPCs in quest. It was nice like, knowing you. Yeah. And he just he flew out the spaceship. <laughs> Like uh, wow, even the NPCs can like travel to space without loading. Yeah. I can't do that. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> must be nice for some. No loading screen for you. Uh, but yeah, I don't <laughs> know. What about you, Brian? What What do you think is going to happen with Elder Scrolls Six? My most optimistic take is that we will get a a because it's uh, it's under Microsoft now. I think they'll make sure it's less buggy and, and, and more polished. I think the most optimistic take is we will get another Elder Scrolls game. In a sense, by the numbers, it'll be like Skyrim or Oblivion. Mm -hmm. It'll be the most beautiful. It'll have the best game, gun, like uh, combat. Yep. And if they could, because, well, first of all, do you agree? I feel like Starfield was a step up in the writing from Fallout 4. I don't know if you agree with that or not. I, that, that's how I feel. Starfield was, you mean? Starfield was a step up okay. in the writing department from yeah, Fallout I think 4. Yeah, so. I, I think so. I think okay. Fallout 4 is arguably one of the most poorly written AAA video games of all time. <laughs> Like, you think Starfield is? No, Fallout. Fallout. Okay, Starfield? yeah, yeah. Oh. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I okay, just I think like. it's I think it's narrative tripe. In all so, honesty. so where so so to paint a picture for the audience here, where do you give me on a scale of one to ten Skyrim's writing, Fallout 4's writing, and Starfield, so we can get an idea of where you think it is. I think Starfield's the best. Okay, even better than Skyrim. Yeah. I, okay, I think so that, that I think plays Skyrim, perfectly into yeah. what I'm saying. And I think Skyrim is probably like that second second okay. area, and then you've got like Fallout 4 and then Fallout 3. Actually, I'd say Fallout 3 is like Fallout 3 is just below Skyrim. So I think I think you've got uh yeah, so you've got Starfield, Skyrim, Fallout 3, Fallout 4, the bomb. Okay, and, and okay, actually just take it one step further to compare different teams. Obsidian, New Vegas. Let's say they're a 10. Where is what you would say Bethesda's peak writing in Starfield? Where is Starfield? Seven, eight, worse, better, the, comparatively to New Vegas. Like obviously, to New, New Vegas. Vegas. New, Vegas New Vegas is, is a ten. Clearly, yeah, New Vegas is like high, like the ten, the tennis of ten I can give for a Western RPG. But I think that, um, I, I think, I think Starfield. Sta where does it come? From? <sighs> yeah, I, I think, I think Starfield. I mean, no, no, I, I'm just trying to think, like in, in terms of that. I think, I think it's a seven. That sounds fair. I don't think okay. it goes anywhere above that in relation. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think to be most optimistic, I think we get, um. Yeah, I think we the most optimistic and realistic take I have for when we get Elder Scrolls is we get Elder Scrolls 6, fall of 2028. It has great, beautiful graphics. It has yep. the best combat, and it has writing on the level of Starfield or a little better. Um, and it's a, another solid entry into Elder Scrolls. I don't think we're going to get some of these lavish ideas people especially after playing starfield cuz right, there was a point where i thought starfield could be like there was a point where i thought starfield could be way more than it was right like yeah. i thought at one point maybe i remember i remember those days i thought at one at one point i thought you'd be able to just fly your ship around space mm -hmm. organically land on the planets and now bear with me here i thought the planets would be like fully populated and not because i thought the Bethesda had the time to develop a thousand planets independently. What I thought, not being a game developer, is that they would have all of these uh, handcrafted things, like just a thousand handcrafted things that they would be able to plug into an algorithm mm. and have the random planets generate. So like the whole planet would have a lot going on. And, and I'm sure you constantly would run into things you'd seen before, but it'd be more resemblant of like, oh, I land on a planet and it feels like Skyrim, yeah. not I land on a planet and it feels barren. So at one point, I thought Starfield was going to be so, so ambitious with all the time they took and all the new hardware. So one, what I'm doing, what I'm say, saying is... One thing ahead. I will say, like, just to before you, like, yeah. go off uh, go off on your uh, crazy-ass rant, but, like, one thing I will say is, like, I think that, I think that, like, when they were making the game, they clearly wanted to, like, obviously do that exploration part of the game. No doubt. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and obviously the vastness of space is like that kind of like they got like kind of like wide eyed and they were like, oh, let's let's do that. Yeah. Someone like wrote it on yeah. the board and was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's well, it. Todd Howard said at one point, I think they said that they once they figured out they could do 100 planets, it took like no more effort to do a thousand. So he's yeah. just like, screw it. Let's do a thousand. Yeah, 100 percent. But I honestly yeah. think like they like I think in in like a sort of high, um idealistic world in terms of like what starfield could have been developed as i genuinely think that like the the sweet spot would have been like maybe three or four planets because i think that would have yeah that that in many ways would have probably fit more with like the theme of starfield in terms of like well, and, new and age if one exploration planet, if one planet it doesn't have to be but if one planet felt like yeah the scale of skyrim mm. so that means four planets felt like four skyrims um, once again, I'm not saying they actually developed four Skyrim's worth, but if it felt like that, yeah. that would have been huge. You would have yeah. felt like you were really traveling in space. Yeah, 100%. You know? like, it didn't just, need look to be at so Giant fast. Survivor. You, you yeah. travel like three planets. You feel like you're traveling in space. Yeah, 100%. But yeah. anyway, carry on. Um, but yeah, what, no, what I was saying is, so now that I know kind of like where Bethesda is and, and that where, where they're doing the same things over and over again and where they're not as loftily as ambitious as I thought, I think the most ambitious or the, the, the best I can, I can say, the most positive is in, in 2028, in the fall, we'll get a, a, a beautiful looking, you know, uh, Elder Scrolls game with the best the best combat and and writing as good as Starfield, maybe a little bit better. Mm. And that'll kind of be the show. I think some people are picturing, oh, what we might get out of the next Elder Scrolls is it's the entire world of Tamriel. And it's happen. got the animation of cyberpunk. And That's it's got happen. like the level of writing of New Vegas. I feel like all of that is pretty much completely out of the question. And I think some people like my brother, if he's listening, I think he would probably say that's never what I expected. Yeah. I think my brother would probably expect something comparable to Skyrim again. Yeah. And I think that's what you'll get. I just think that like Skyrim in 2011 was like, oh, other developers need to take a look at this. This yeah. is massive scale, open world, yeah. uh, player uh, freedom to mm -hmm. expression. Yep. Like, and then you could see how the industry was completely like took off and took inspiration from Skyrim from there. Even Witcher 3, like Cyber yep. CD Project Red was looking at Skyrim. So I think best case scenario, we're going to get a Skyrim level game in 2028. But like, I feel like a Skyrim level game would already feel like uh, I've seen it before uh, outdated yeah. now in 2024. I'm telling you, we're going to get that in four or five years from now. So that's my most... That's my most, I, I think that's probably what will happen. I, I don't think we're going to get a crap game. I think we're going to get a good game, but I, I think, think it'll be, yeah. it's not going to hit the same. Yeah, I think I think that's like, you, you kind of weird, you kind of got like a catch 22 with Bethesda right now in terms of like, they don't want to move away from this engine because it gives their games this identity or mm -hmm. in many ways, like, like this sounds bad, but like I feel like in, in many ways, Bethesda fans and us, not even just Bethesda fans, but just the industry in general, we've kind of like, I feel like Bethesda of Stockholm syndrome syndrome does into like kind of thinking that the creation engine can is the only engine on the planet that can do what the creation engine can do. And in many ways, like maybe it can it got me thinking that. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. And like you would be excused for thinking that. And maybe like you're completely right in thinking that. I don't know. We don't have the details, but I, I honestly think like with the obviously unveil of Unreal be doing what crazy shit that it's doing, uh I don't know. The sky's the limit with that fucking engine, dude. Just the, shit just the fact, like, Starfield, you can drop a empty bottle in grass on a random planet yeah. and then come back 200 hours and the bottle's still in the exact spot you dropped. Yes. Like, there's no other game out nope. there that can do that. No. Know? 100%. 100%. And, yeah, but I, I just think, like, the problem with Bethesda is they're in that Catch-22 situation. Like, they're, they're, they're kind of attached to this... Uh, proprietary software this proprietary framework that is the creation engine um and they keep like marketing it as like it's updated and stuff but people are kind of like side-eyeing it all the time and and they know that like when they make it they've always got to like make exceptions for this physics engine that keeps coming in and, and because of that alongside all the features it, it's kind of like they can they can't push to the level of like a cyberpunk 2077 in terms of what we expect from our rpgs in in the modern day sort yeah. of gaming industry but at the same time that's also a benefit in many ways to them because that's the engine and system that gives the games yep. what it is. So it's kind of like the, if they they zig, they should have zagged, and if they zagged, they should have zigged. And I don't know. This is the thing. This is the problem with Bethesda for me is like I I can't I can't sit here and like get behind any of their decisions anymore from a creative sense because I feel like they're just intentionally railroading themselves into it. Whether a logical reason is behind it or not, which it most likely is because they know what they're fucking doing. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. 
But at the end of the day, it's like, how can I sit here as a gamer who's buying your product and a consumer and you're kind of like, you're not sh like, I wouldn't say you're shipping me a broken product because you're definitely not because it works pretty much like, I mean, like you said, Starfield was a much better release than like all the other Bethesda games up until this point. Yeah. But you are, sh you are shipping me a game that I know will have caveats every single time. And because of that, I always feel like, like now, ever since Starfield, like I am not hyped for Elder Scrolls at all. Obviously, ask me once that gameplay trailer drops again because I might. You will my be. Word. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but like, I don't know. So yeah, it's an interesting conversation because, and I've had this. I've talked to my brother about with my brother about this quite a bit. Like, mm. it seems to me where we're at with Bethesda is that they are going to do Bethesda games yeah, as will. we've always known them, mm -hmm. and they're not going to change in any way. And there's a big pro and a big con to that. I, I think the big, I don't know if you'll agree with this. I think the big pro to that is like, well, at least I know what to expect and I know what I'm getting and I mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. You can bank on it. Yeah. Because if I look at Halo, I think once, Bu I think once Bungie left, I mean, if you go watch the, the documentaries for Halo four, mm. there's literal employee, new employees to 343 saying, like I'm paraphrasing, but they're basically saying like, I know what a lot of people want out of the next Halo yep. is more of what they know and love, but they don't want that. They just don't know that they don't want that. They want something <laughs> new and fresh. And if you look at Halo 4, 5, and Infinite, I mean, of course, they're Halo games. There's plenty of things to, that are similar, but at yep. the same time, like at the same time, they kind of change the series a lot. Yeah. Like like from 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 Halo 1 to Reach, it kind of felt like, and even Reach was getting a little dicey here and there, but mm. like for the most part, it just felt like Bungie doing Bungie things with Halo. Yeah, it felt yeah, like, yeah. but then you get to 4 and it's kind of like, oh, this is way different. You get to 5 and it's like, oh, okay, squad mechanics, revive, you know, Chief's barely in the game. Okay, and then you get, to, and then Infinite even, which I love, I always talk about which I love, it's like, okay, kind of scraps a lot of the narrative we were building. Um, it's open world, um, yeah. but it's not like, too dense and then the, the multiplayer mm. suites not as big so you know if you look at halo for ex by example i think i think if we could look back and say like well if, if all 343 had given us for the last 15 years was halo 3 part 2 and halo 3 part 3 and halo 3 part 4 it might have been samey but people would have, would have been like maybe like oh well it's more like even assassin's creed right and I, correct me if i'm wrong because you know assassin's creed better mm. than me and i know assassin's creed has changed a lot over the years yeah but i think off. there was a sense I think there was a sentiment for a while that even if I'm not a huge fan of this year's Assassin's Creed, I like Assassin's Creed and I enjoy them every year. Right. They had there was some consistency there, mm. uh, either either all the way or, or for the most part. And, and Halo, Halo got very like, what are we doing here? Like whiplash and, and stuff like that. So yep. I think the big pro for Bethesda is maybe they just stay in their lane and make their type of games and they come out and they're great and their fan base loves it. But I think that will I think the big con is that will forever remove them from what they experienced with Skyrim up yeah. Fallout 4 days, where it was like, this is a premier developer doing something new we haven't seen, right? Like, yeah. that's going to go to CD Projekt Red. That's going to go to Larian. That's going to go to studios that I maybe haven't even heard of yet. Uh, that That's where that's going to go. And if they're fine to fall out of that and just become the studio that does the same thing over and over again, that if they're fine with that, that might not be bad. And then I would prefer that. Yeah. to something where it's just so inconsistent, right? Or even like a Bioware, right? Where it's like a Dragon Age Inquisition or Dragon Age Origins. Oh yeah, uh, Dragon Age 2. I don't know. Inquisition, yeah. maybe? Uh, Anthem? What were you thinking? Yeah. Mass Effect and Drama? And now what? Dreadwolf. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dre it's all over the place. So like if they yeah. can just maintain consistency, like that's one thing I'll give them. I do think they should definitely look long and hard at Starfield and say, do we ever want to make a game where we split up the exploration in a million loading screens again? I think mm. that was a bad idea. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I'll just pass it over to you. What, what do you have to say on what I said there before we go on, Joe? Yeah, I, I think, in all honesty, what you're touching on is that this is the worst time in the in, in the games industry in general for AAA video games to bank on an experimental mm -hmm. sort of left field take yeah. on their franchises. You know, with the ballooning of development costs, um, obviously with Microsoft owning Bethesda now, it gives them a lot more freedom to make those mistakes, most likely. Um, but I think that, I just think it's the worst time for them. I think it's the worst time for them to experiment. And I honestly think, like, if they want to be... I think you touched on a good thing that gives me a, a thought here. If they want to 
B, the industry leaders alongside CD Projekt Red and Larry and like you said and stuff like that, then I th I feel like some serious changes to the formula has to come in, whether it's an engine overhaul to a ridiculous extent or it's an engine change or whether it's just how they design their games in general, you know, like maybe not relying on physics engines as much. Like, do we need them? You know, stuff like that. Yeah. I, so, I thought about asking that earlier, like w maybe that's worth sacrificing, but I think there's a lot of Bethesda hardcore fans who'd be like, there's no way I'm accepting that. Yeah. Yeah. Gotta have the physics. Yeah. yeah. Cause it does add to the prestige of the product in many ways. You know, when you kick over a bucket or you fuss throw a dar an entire room and everything just goes ape, like ape shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, but if I felt the way I do about, one of several characters in cyberpunk in a, in a Bethesda game that could be awesome. But yeah. at the same time, and, and I, I've heard many people say this, including my brother, and I think it's fair. I, I, I don't want Bethesda games to be CD Projekt Red games. I don't. No. I, I get that from CD Projekt Red. So, like, I, I think it's just an easy comparison because they're similar similar time frame releases and yes. similar type games. But, Westerns, like, yeah. I want Bethesda to be Bethesda. And I also, I don't want to play a game. I don't want Bethesda to be a game where I'm, like, smoking a joint while banging a hooker right like that's yeah, not yeah. bethesda no. you know what i mean no 100 so, i feel like I interrupted your thought though joe yeah all i was gonna say was like but if they want to stay like obviously you have the innovative versus the iterative and they're not mutually exclusive in game design you can do both obviously but i think that like when it comes to i think when it comes to like bethesda now they've obviously ever since skyrim they've settled for iterative in many ways um and yeah. that's fine because like we like some of my favorite games are completely iterative like god of war ragnarok it's a completely iterative game there's nothing about that that's innovative if anything but they've only pulled opposite. that trick one time but they've well, I mean, only pulled well, they that did trick it with one the original time. god of war series but, but you know but let me extend that further then like completely being like honest here like sony first party in general the majority of what sony is now is iterative. very similar there there is very little innovative features in in sony first party video games that are on a triple a level it just doesn't exist um yeah. so yeah and i just think they've got two roads to go down it's as simple as that and i think that's where i kind of end with where it comes to like my thoughts on what elder scrolls 6 can or should be you can go the more risky innovative route uh or you can go the more safe iterative and yeah. if I if I obviously if I was a betting man, I would obviously bet on the second second version, the latter version, because that's what brings in the money. And obviously Xbox are looking for their return on investment when it comes to uh, Skyrim and obviously future Fallout games. So the, the, I can't see them experimenting. But one thing I will say is like just because they're iterative doesn't mean they can't improve on things. We saw the improvements yeah. to the writing in, from Fallout 4 to Starfield. We saw the, you know, depending on your opinion, the improvements to the to the the combat or the, the faction quest lines or whatever. Obviously, like that obviously gets into the nuance depending on the person you ask. But it's all yeah. there depending on the individual you ask for. Uh, you ask. And I also think Starfield's by far the most beautiful game, and I don't oh, think yeah. it's just. I don't think it's just because it's on Series X either. Mm, I think it. Yeah. I think it's just a more beautiful game than yeah. any prior game they've made. Yeah, hundred percent. So yeah. no, it's it's it's. I love Bethesda, dude, and and I think the reason. I, mean, I know. I know the reason we're having this is because you know, a lot of people like me sat down to watch the Fallout show. Yeah. With Bang little in. expectations, because. It's a video game show, right? And you yeah. watch it, and that show so fundamentally understands what Fallout is and what a lot of the Bethesda, it, to an extent, I get what you're saying. It's it's Bethesda's Fallout, right? <laughs> but it's so, it also so deeply, like, gives you the vibes of your favorite moments with Bethesda. Yeah, 100%. And I think when you get done watching that show, that has you reflect on the company and what they've put out, and you just, and I know for me, I feel so nostalgic. I feel so... Mm -hmm. I got these rose tinted glasses for these great moments oh, I had with Bethesda, yeah. with Bethesda. And uh, I just want to see them succeed because to me, to me, this is, this, I can't believe I'm saying this, this is crazy. I'm saying this, but like the Fallout TV show is my favorite Bethesda, if you count it, my favorite okay. Bethesda products in Skyrim. The show. Yeah. That is. That doesn't mean that I like shows better than games or I'm not no. even saying I would give up Fallout 4 and, 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 and uh, Starfield for the show, but like, the, the most satisfying product has been the show for me, and I want to see another awesome game from them, and I want to see what they can do, and I, yeah. I just hope for the best with them. And, and like I said, I I mean, I did really like Starfield, and I do really like that game. You know, I'm, I'm pretty critical on it. I know Joe doesn't like it as me, and he's maybe even more critical on it. But uh, I guess my, my final question for you, Joe, before we, we get out of here would be, where does Bethesda stand for you as a whole today? How do you look at them? Like, let's like your premier developers mm. for you, your most premier developers, as far as for me, knowing, knowing you well, Joe, 
is probably CD Projekt Red and Sony Santa Monica, right? Am I wrong? Kojima Productions. Yeah, I would have said Kojima, but I'm like, yeah. I guess I should have just said Kojima, but I, I feel like most people go to Metal Gear, and that's like that's Konami, and then obviously he has Death Stranding under him though, yeah. which is which you love. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, like you're right, that's you're like, right. yeah, that's the premiere for you right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and give me an example. What's what's a studio or two you would say is like, if you want to be mean, just be like they're kind of dog shit right now. Like, what's a studio you'd say is oh. like, like just bad? I don't know if like. <laughs> Like, are we talking AAA? Like, what are we- I mean, it can kind of be whatever. I'm trying to think off the top of my head without, because my I don't, I don't actually think this, but my first thought was Ubisoft, but I don't think they're dog shit at all. I just I just don't really care yeah. for a lot of them, what um, they do, but um, I'm trying to think. Yeah. I, 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 gotta, I gotta say this, like, people are gonna hate me saying this, but like, 343. Okay. Hey, well, I'll, it's, yeah, I'll let you, okay, so. <laughs> like, like, so the, like, even if I take myself yeah. away, like, take Halo Take Joe. Joe's not here right now. Okay, you're talking yeah. to just talking to Jimmy. You know what I'm saying, okay. I feel like if Jimmy like read all the fucking cliff notes on like what ha- what's happened to three four three in the like past fucking decade, right? In relation to Halo, he'd be like, I, "How is this company still open?" <laughs> I feel like what the yeah, what the fuck is going on? Like, and that's just that's Jimmy. You know and how saying? did they only change their top management in the like thirteenth year? <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. you know, which so, is, yeah. Which so is I, I would say, did you say top two or something? Like you gave, you I said a couple if you can think of it, but even Blue one is just fine. Bloober team. Okay, so if like, Sorry, and I, 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 if you guys don't know me, I love using number skills, but like, yeah. if your premier studios are just for ease of, of 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 the conversation, if your premier studios are at that ten ten level, Kojima, Santa Monica, CD Projekt Red, mm. and three four three is at you know three out of ten, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's Bethesda sit for you on that scale? Uh, solid eight. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. I, so I think, and I think that paints a good perspective, you know, and kind of, kind of makes yeah, it seem we've like, positive. We, we, yeah. We've sat here and we've like bagged on Starfield or whatever, like all this time. But in many ways, like I feel like, even though we focused on the the nuance of the negative for mm. a, a decent amount of time this episode, I feel like that's all because we still like the unsung positives are still there of Starfield, and in many ways, yeah. we don't have to say what they are. Um, we've yeah. we've touched upon them, obviously, yeah. like I said, gameplay and stuff like that mm-hmm. across the board and all that stuff. But for like Bethesda games in general, the unsung positives are there, and everyone knows what they are. It's as simple yeah. as that. You know, you jump They're into still, a Bethesda yeah. game, you know, like you know instantly. You're like, oh, this is fucking dope, and anyone that isn't like a game critic or whatever can pick that shit up immediately. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm glad we agree. I think we're actually on the exact same page with this because I, I think I think Bethesda still at this moment is a premier video game studio yes for me there for me the big the big l and maybe you maybe it's not an l but for me the big l for bethesda is they're no longer in the tier where larian and cd project red are i used to think they were there yeah uh, and i think it's it's just that level of like relativity and comparison that that yeah. brings that in it kind of comes back to our previous episode on sacred games daily where we was talking about like a, an xbox if you're on a desert island a series x it's a fire console freaking awesome like, it's yeah. an awesome game but like because it's in the in the ring with a nintendo and a playstation and we have we're all tapped into yeah. these feeds obviously we have that level of comparison and we can't see the wood for the trees yeah. in many ways so yeah so it's, it's still a premier developer it's just you know they it's like they used to be s tier and now they're just like settling for like low a and then like yeah. that's still really good you know and uh yeah but I, and I think and i know like there's so many people that are like oh well i don't care like just bethesda be what it is but i i do think like being a hardcore Bethesda fan who likes that type of experience, that's not enough to secure their success and livelihood forever, right? Like they have mm. to evolve with the times and to what degree that needs to be, I, I'm not sure, you know, um, but yeah. I'm excited to see what they got coming next. And like, I mean, just like just being so refreshed by the Fallout TV show, I'm just like, yeah, I'm just that, reminiscing on their, on been. their, their best time. I'm even reminiscing on the great times I had in Starfield because I'm, because there's a lot of good there. Mm. Um, and I'm just uh, excited to see where they go next. So you got any final thoughts on? Yeah, I mean, Bethesda I, I kind of want to just touch on like the, the show a little bit and stuff and like. OK, yeah, sure. I mean, it, like I got full body chills. There's a part where the main character is in a vault, right? I won't say what, but she just she kind of like opens up a flag. And it's an it's the flag of the NCR from Fallout New Vegas. And it's like it plays the, the theme and it's like I got 
chills. Hits you in the feels. It's yeah. fucking good, dude. And like the the comedy and stuff is great, and the production level is fucking fire. The power armor looks great. The writing is really fucking good. Obviously, like I have trouble with it because like, I kind of want to touch on this because I said I, w- I would earlier in the, at the start of the episode quickly. But like the the biggest issue I have with like Fallout, uh, having played one and two uh, from uh, Black Island into play, is that. Bethesda's Fallout is so obsessed with like the symbolism of the what is in the wasteland or what Fallout is. So you're talking bottle caps, you're talking Brotherhood of Steel, you're talking Enclave, you're talking ghouls, whatever the fuck. And the thing that Fallout always had when it was under interplay was that it was retrofuturism, but it wasn't about the retrofuturism and it wasn't about that style so much. And Bethesda is so obsessed with kind of talking about people in the ashes immediately after the bombs fall. And it's evident when you play their their games. Everything is still, like, shit in many ways. Mm-hmm. Like, the, the debris all over the place. No one's cleared up. Society is whack still, hundreds of years later. Um, and while it's not, like, out there that it can't happen like this, it just feels like nothing progresses for the sake of Bethesda's own little fishbowl of a experiment of narrative if that yeah. if i want to put it like that whereas like if you, again if you go back to the interplay and the black isle games there's already settlements very early on after the bombs drop with the vault dweller with shady sands and stuff that feels like a place that's lived in obviously the mm-hmm. technology isn't there to show like a scaled world and stuff like that yeah but it feels like it's about it's post post apocalypse rather than post apocalypse which is what bethesda's is and that's like always like a problem i have with Bethesda's games in general, like, or not Bethesda's games in general, but but Fallout, because I have that level, again, of that, like, relativity and comparison. It's it's this idea that, like, nothing's moving in this world. The Brotherhood of Steel has somehow still got a foothold, even though they're such a, like, a insular faction that should have really died off. And this is one of the things I really appreciate, appreciate about New Vegas, is, like, the Brotherhood of Steel are basically nothing. And I love that. Um, but yeah, Too Long Don't Read, it's like, I just think... They miss the point of like what uh, Starfield, what uh, Fallout is in general as a franchise because of that like obsession with symbolism. I mean, even for in Fallout Two, you don't have bottle caps as a currency, right? They move on from it because society establishes that. But then when Fallout Three comes around, you have bottle caps again, and obviously yeah. it's in a different location. It's in the Capital Wasteland as opposed as opposed to California. But the point is, is it's like. How did this happen? And they retroactively write it in, essentially, obviously, right? As far as I'm aware, anyway. And it's just, it's little things like that where it's like, we're not moving. We're not moving in, in any way. Um, but aside from that, like to kind of give you a shit sandwich and end on a positive note, the show is fucking fire. The, some, some of the changes that, you know, come in Fallout 4 are dope that I love. You know, the gunplay, the power armor, the glowing sea, stuff like that. Um, yeah. It's good stuff. Bethesda is still an, an, an 8 out of 10 fucking developer for me. And I mean, I'm still excited to see what they have in future. I just don't know if I'm going to be as excited for Elder Scrolls 6 as I was for Starfield. And yeah. I definitely don't know if I'll be ex- as excited for Elder Scrolls 6 as I was for Skyrim. So it's as simple as that, really. Absolutely. That makes, that makes complete sense. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's interesting, you know, looking at the show and how it, it kind of marries what Bethesda's done with the universe mm. and what was done with the universe before when it was Black Isle. Mm, but sure. the common thing that all the Bethesda games have, and I think you were kind of touching on this, but I'm going to put it into different words, is Bethesda likes to make you the most important person yeah, in the world. Yeah, power fantasy. Yep. It's a power fantasy. And, and that's not what the Fallout games originally were. Nope. That's not really what New Vegas is. Yeah. Um, but when you are in Fallout 3, it's like, your dad left the vault. He's going to bring water to everyone. You're his son. Yeah. Fallout 4, they took your kid. You got to find your kid. Your kid is the leader of the Institute. Yes. You know, um, Skyrim, you're the dragonborn. Yep. Starfield, I won't spoil it, but there's something there. Yes. You know, and it's always, that's always what it is. So I think for, I think what you're kind of talking about is like, there's just a much more grounded approach to what yep. Fallout usually, originally was. And, and, and Bethesda being the like power fantasy, they're like, Let's hype up the the bombs have just fallen. 
Let's hype up the music from the 1950s. Let's hype up that they're, they're using caps. Yeah. Let's hype up all this stuff that just really makes it like, and, and I mean, a part of that, that's what Bethesda is. So I like that, but it's like, it's cool, as a, dude. Like as a, as a fallout, like and I'm talking about you cause I've never played. Um, sure. I have played, I have beaten a Vegas, but I haven't played the originals as an original fallout fan. It's like, well, maybe if you guys could just lean a little bit more into the DNA of what this originally was, mm. even just some, yeah. that would be that would make it better yeah and like here's the thing like I, in terms of like grounded nature and not being the center of the world uh, it, I, that's down to preference right like your brother creighton like he he might love that right like he clearly loved yeah. that and that's that's all him that's great i love that for him and i, still and I think do he actually well. i think he actually prefers black isle um fallout though but oh really ahead. oh wow yeah. that's interesting but new, yeah he's he's mostly said new vegas is his favorite Wow, yeah. So he likes Obsidian, Black Isle, yeah. Like yeah, Bethesda, Bethesda is his favorite developer, but he thinks New Vegas is the best Fallout. So I guess he's okay. the best of both worlds in that yeah, sense. Yeah, I respect that opinion. That's that's nuanced. But like, yeah, so like, what was I saying anyway? Um, I've lost my train of thought, Brian. Uh, talking about the differences, power fantasy, um, yes. Black Isle. So like when I, yeah. when I play my RPGs, the reason, one of the reasons why I love Cyberpunk so much, and, and this is getting candid, is like, as everyone knows me in the Discord, like I like to go like mountain, like hiking and camping and stuff. And one of the things I really appreciate about like doing that as a hobby is like it kind of wait well, it doesn't kind of it very much just makes everything go out the window. Everything that you are worrying about, uh, you know, thinking on, um, even things that you're excited for that isn't connected to the sort of normal, more grounded touching grass side of life goes away and when you sit like on a rock or you sit like on the top of that mountain and you hit that summit it's like it's the best feeling in the world and you're sitting around the camp with your buddies and stuff and in many ways like that that kind of nature that i have bleeds into the way that i like my video games the reason why i like cyberpunk is because you're sitting on a rooftop with johnny debating about life and and choosing where you want to go and at the end of the day like even though you're going to make a massive impact depending on your choice really you're still just another footnote in in night city story and the same goes for like fallout new vegas you know like you are a footnote in terms of what happens in that mojave wasteland by the end of it in many ways and and it and i think in many ways the witcher is the same the same way you know like when you play the witcher like uh gerald is not the main thing of that world it's the same in the books he's not the main focal point um and yeah i just love that style yeah. of game and i that's not to knock on bethesda at all because bethesda do another thing for my goopy goblin goblin gamer brain yeah. like massively which is that that uh sort of power fantasy so yeah absolutely um just so, a lot a lot of love here for Bethesda. I think you guys can tell even more now after we've spent 90 minutes talking about yep. this that like a lot of the pessimism that we would have for Bethesda comes from the deep love we have yes. for them and the experiences they've offered yep. before. I got a final would you rather for you if you're ready to get are you ready to get out of here, Joe? Let's or go. Something else you want no, 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 let's go. Uh I, I think this is a good would you rather, but it's also one that I think you're gonna I, I know the answer pretty pretty quickly. Um you get to choose one of these two timelines. Okay. Um Death Stranding. Two comes out and it is a six out of 10 game, but the next Elder Scrolls is beyond Skyrim level quality, 10, 10 generational, or the next Elder Scrolls is six out of 10 okay. <laughs> and Death Stranding two is generational 10 out of 10. Which future would you rather live in? As no in, wrong answer. As in this 6 out of 10 for Death Stranding is like me giving it a 6 out of 10 or objective across it's, the board. It, this, is, this is all how Joe feels. Like, oh, I wish you yeah, could feel the six way. Of, oh, no. Yeah, man, yeah this no, is how you no. feel. You, you're like, you know, the reason I say 6 out of 10 because that means that whichever game gets the 6, it's still competent and fun. It's just kind of like, oh, real disappointing. Okay. You know, so. Uh, I'm taking, I'm taking Death Stranding at the top. Like I knew, I thought okay, so, but the reason is about it, yeah. not even that. I feel like if you have a six out of ten video game for Death Stranding for me, Death Stranding two, it's a it's fundamentally crap, flawed game, <laughs> and there's not like I yeah. I would those issues. I just know because I know the first game is yeah. is an issue of design, and mm -hmm. Kojima would not be able to patch that or anything. Whereas yeah. I feel like if Sky, if Skyrim two if Skyrim two came out right and it's a six out of ten, I feel like a lot of that will probably be due to like bugs and technical there'll probably be a lot of like people that. that love it anyways and Whereas, mods, like, no one will love mods. a death stranding 2 if joe yep. gives it a six yes exactly if i'm that low on it it's over it's over or, wait, or something crazy could happen joe death stranding 2 could come out 
And it could be one of those games that gets nines and tens from everyone, but you just hate it. It's like nothing like the first Death Stranding. Oh, it could be that, that way too. That's a bad timeline. Yeah, that was so. Uh, all righty. All right. Yeah. Uh, as we get out of here, Joe, what is your favorite Bethesda game of all time? It's gonna be Skyrim. Skyrim. It's For me, Skyrim. it's Oblivion. I think Skyrim's better in a lot of other in a lot of ways, but yeah. for me, it's Oblivion. I really like Oblivion. I think the quests in Oblivion are better. Yeah. But guys, we both love Bethesda. Um, we're love excited. Uh, watching this Fallout show has been great. We they have so many games we love. Uh, we'd love to hear you uh, either write in or leave a comment or voicemail, whatever. Tell us what your favorite Bethesda game is. Where did they surprise you the most? Where did they let you down? Uh, is Starfield too hated on or is it uh, appropriately critiqued? We love you guys. Thank you so much for listening to another Sacred Games Daily. And as always, keep it sacred daily. Peace.